Hey everyone, welcome back. It's Lucid, and I'm once again joined by the very knowledgeable Sai. This is Sai joining the very knowledgeable Lucid on another turn. And just looking at the flags in the combats here, I am very excited just to see TNG pushing back because it looks like most of these battles are TNG on the offensive. So it looks like they're actually looking to use their armies, as you pointed out last turn. They were quite dense. Uh, to try to retake some lost ground, particularly since they can expect some of the people pushing into them to back off due to the vengeful waters that they put up last turn. Yeah, absolutely. Message from TNG, vengeful water success. And we even took down Gelgate, not Pan's most important global, but certainly feels like we're causing some real pay, pain on our way out of the game. I counted 28 Synthar Sages, two Dryads, two Pans, two Agarthan Mages, including a White Mage, Three Zabalbin mages, one Dukado, 17 scouts, a handful of commanders, and an independent monster boar killed this, by this turn. Uh, we're still very much doomed, but it's going to be a lot harder for our enemies to push into our territories with ventral waters to deal with. Survivors of the size 5 ice elemental attacks, including three pans, the horror, one centaur sage, and two Arithian golems. And golems, by the way, can die to, to water elementals pretty yeah. fast. Like, a couple bad damage. rolls. The Scotata Volturnus is probably what saved them. Yeah, that and they had um, a lightning spear. So between the two, they should be okay. Yeah. But even then, even with the Scotata, I think you can still die to, you know. Yeah, you do oh, maybe that. not an ice elemental. The water elementals would kill him, but. Yeah, since golems are size five, they don't get trampled. Yeah. Depending on their gear, they can actually still suffer from the cold aura, though. Yeah. And one's a Balvin mage with Aussie guards. Hey, okay. let's take a look. Next message. Pan's magic phase attack interrupted an army we were moving from the enchantment site to the throne of Moon to kill Agartha if he got greedy. Guess we'll sit still for now. Doesn't seem like Agartha is going to move on that throne with an army given the vengeful waters. Yeah, okay. that's another thing that we were talking about is that while the thrones do enable whoever captures them to push back the vengeful waters... Because the thrones are spreading TNT's dominion for now, it also means that they're going to be fairly high down provinces to actually try to push into. Right. Except the Throne of Water was only two, but yeah. I'm guessing the one near Agartha was Yeah, the Throne a of Water higher. was different just because it was like on the edge of TNT's territory, so it was being down pushed by both Erythia and Shabalba. Yeah. Message from Gap. TNT casting Vigil Waters is good for him, but also very good for me. I've lost several scouts in his lands, while other players have lost a lot more. That means, at least for a good while, uh, his lands and thrones won't be captured by others. And because I have no claims to those lands, obviously it indirectly benefits me. This turn has been very bad for Pan, because he not only lost a lot of mages, but also Galegate, in which he was heavily invested. I think this puts him in position 3, at least for a while. <clears throat> and whether Zabalba or Gath, is number one, only time will tell. I don't think there's a question in my mind as to who's higher between Zabalba or Gath. Yeah, I but... think it's one of those Fog of War th things, though, where because players know what their limitations are and tend to perceive only the strengths of the armies that they're going up against, he might have a higher opinion of what Shabalba's capabilities are without really taking into account that research difference, which has been holding Shabalba back for pretty much the entire game since their war with uh, Arcocephaly. Yeah, I mean, that's fair. I think there's also a little bit of low-key... I mean, this thing that's going to be happening is there's always a little bit of low-key Diplo that's happening in messages to Omniscience because, you know, while we are 30 he turns ahead of the real game, or behind the real game, you know, it's still, like, our casting of it still will have some impact. Hopefully it's small enough to be not too important. But it'll still have some impact on how the game plays out. Yeah, I don't know how much different players actually value that. Because my impression of Maven, the Gath player, was largely just that he's a, a very open dude that just really likes talking about Dominions. But he also doesn't have the highest opinion of himself in terms of, like, his being a top-tier Dominions player. Which he obviously is, you know, particularly given how well he's doing in the final here so far. So he just might be underplaying himself, not because, you know, he's trying to sell himself as weak, but just because he doesn't weigh his strengths quite as heavily as we do from our omniscient position. Yeah. And I'm not saying it is like a bad thing. I'm not like, oh, he's trying to like manipulate us to think a certain thing. I think everybody, in my, my opinion, 
but I think everybody is going to at least have an eye. I mean, cause you're, you're thinking about what types of things you tell omniscience, you know, is this something, you know, like you don't want to tell omniscience how much you put into a global, right? Because that would obviously affect the game state 30 turns from now, potentially. I don't know. I, so, I mean, as a player, I, I did tell omniscience exactly how much I'd put into my late game gift of health and that my mother oak was min cast. Yeah. But we told that, I think you told us the min cast at the very end. Oh, I don't think that. Yeah, I, I, I don't think you told us that early. Because I, I tend to perceive that when you first put up a gem gen, that it's always min cast. But like, I don't know. I, I think that, you know, again, as a, a player, my, what I was telling omniscience was, was really just like my comments on the game state. And it, it's yeah. actually kind of nice, like having an in-game thing to share to when you're putting stuff together. It's kind of like having an extra hydro partner. Yeah. You know, yeah. You have that rubber ducky to talk The to. rubber duck. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I, I don't think he's lying. I just think there's like a, an inclination to subtly try to... I mean, we've seen other players doing this too. And I think, you know, could be just fog of war, could be undervaluing, you know, like how good of a player they are. But anyway. Okay, it's also funny how everyone was so scared of Arithia that coalitions were gathered against him turn 41. But now nobody uh, seriously thinks he's even a contender. And I foresee... That's guilty. That's something that we were guilty of as well. Like I rated Arithia the nation very highly. And I also rated Arithia the player very highly based on his early game because he's able to get out to such a commanding position very early on with those super early forts. I'm like, all right, yeah, this guy's going to be rushing the big spells, getting up that early nexus. Like this is a real threat. And then I like didn't dial down the hype until we saw him start to flounder without yeah. you know, having proper armies assembled as the game went on. Yeah, yeah. I mean, honestly, having some big air mage, you know, like even just a fairy queen or something, put up fog warriors and stuff, like that's going to protect you against bone grinding plays. Like just protecting some of your big stacks with things that are outside of your communion would have gone a long way. And still, we don't, I mean, there was a fairy queen in that last army that he actually lost to the Wailing Winds Blood Rain play. But you know, it, it's very slow seeing these high commitment things come out aside from just throwing more mage bodies at problems. But yeah, and he's been suffering greatly from those battlefield players. Like, you know, aside from the bone grinding stuff that we talked about, we'd seen him lose two different stacks of mages to Rain of Stones, one of which was just clearing out the mages so that his army was unsupported. And another being the entire army actually being forced to run away from you know, losing 20 mages to that. Yeah. So Arithia has absolutely been <clears throat> bleeding those mystics and deducados just on account of not protecting them properly while always having a fairly low troop count because he was investing in those mages to carry for him. Yeah. Okay. I foresee a period of peace, which might not be very fun for the viewers, <coughs> but will be very important for myself. Obviously, it will come down to me fighting Zabalba at some point, but this moment is yet to come. It may seem that time is on his side, and maybe it's true. But I'm going to have cool tricks, which are not exactly brute force. Overall, my path to victory is quite straightforward, and it's how Dominions was being played years ago before the Thrones were introduced. Just overwhelm everyone. Whether it will work, we will see. Okay, I like hearing that. Nothing yeah. this throne rushing business people try to do. I would also um, say that it kind of makes sense with the strengths that we've seen from Gas so far. And that he really just has had the best Doom stack so far. Yeah. So yeah, this is pretty exciting. It's also interesting that the way he phrases it, he's like, obviously it will come down to me fighting Zabalba at some point. But like, the way he says it, it's not like at some point, like, okay, I guess at some point you fight every player. And he, he's like singling out Zabalba, like it's going to be his next war. <laughs> so... Yeah. That's most likely the case just because we can assume his next war is not going to be Pan and like who right. else would he fight? Right. But it's it's funny because in the the Discord, like where they're discussing the current episodes going up, they're like, oh, it's not that tight of an alliance. The alliance between Pan and I, you know, it's like casual, just the same. And then like this message to us, it's like, well, you know, obviously I'm going to be fighting Zabalba at some point, <laughs> not even considering fighting Pan really. Well, part of that, though, was that um, earlier he had identified Chivalba as being the number two rather than Pan. Well, that's sort of true. But, I mean, okay, let's let's look at this claim in more detail now. 
provinces. Pan, Gath, Pan, Zababa. And, you know, sizable 10% gaps between each one. So Ga this actually, I do think, is the actual position. I think it's one, two, three. But that's what I think it is at the moment. I agree, actually. Yeah. Not to say the the province graph always indicates one, two, three, but it's a coincidence here that I think it's the same. Pan an arm and a leg ahead on forts, which I value as I value this graph a lot. Um especially income. Given how Pan is playing, that's gonna be pretty yeah. high value, just because he's relying on being able to continue mass producing those sages. Yeah, income, pan at like double Zabalba's income. So that's a really big deal. Gym income. Okay. Yeah, I don't yep. think there's any way Pan is position three. Yeah, I feel like Zabal is position, position three. No, so. I agree with you, actually. And I think that the biggest thing is what's going to be coming up on this next graph, that research. Uh, we do see Shivalda actually finally ticking up. You know, they've been crawling their way back up these last couple of yeah. turns. Yeah, these uh, have been... This is a noticeably higher slope than they were at. I think they got a big lantern infusion here. They bought gas used lanterns. Right. Yeah, because Gath is almost done. They've got like three turns left. More importantly, I think the Gath started selling off their lanterns when they hit the research goals that they considered super high value. So okay. they'd mentioned that in a message to us, basically, that they'd hit Alt-9 and then they were getting close to Blood-9. And they're like, all right, once we have these, then the other nines can kind of come as we get them. They're not like anything that we need to rush towards. And given that the Sages can't do anything other than research, it makes total sense to sell off the lamps and reduce the rate of their research while also actually getting that gem and come back. Because if you wait too long to sell lamps, then suddenly they're not valuable anymore. Yeah. So this is interesting, this graph. So Dominion, Gath is crushing it. Yeah, that's why and... they were doing blood sacking to push back Vettiheim's Dominion. And then right. they briefly paused their blood sacking, and then Venfa Waters went up, and they turned their blood sacking right back on. Yeah, but, I, you know, whereas, like, you look at the pan graph here, I'll hide the Gath one. Like, it's flat for large periods of time. TNG's flat. Like, everybody else has had large periods of flatness. Gap is just going up and up and up. And what that means, like, because on one hand, your your Dominion graph a lot of times is going to go up and mirror your province graph. Right? But Gap's province graph has had, it's like a period of growth and then plateaus. And Dominion does tend to like, or Dominion tends to like smooth things out and give you like a like a moving average kind of like growth thing of, you know, where like if if you're plateaued for very long periods of time on on provinces, you'll also be plateaued for very long periods of time on Dominions, uh, or on Dominion. But I don't think that's what we're seeing here with Gath. I think this is blood sacking into enemy lands is yeah. what we're getting into well, here. So you've been doing that just to fight Vettiheim's Dominion. And then once you've taken the provinces, of course, you want to keep doing it. And since you already had the blood sacking set up, you know, no reason to turn it off. You're turning right. that Vettiheim land into friendly Dominion, get your, you know, all the scales, because Gath is going, you know, with a fairly heavy scales build into those provinces. So, you know, he has all the reason in the world to keep trying to spread his dom. And then I, I think he actually paused for a turn, possibly to save blood <clears throat> slaves to, you know, afford some... Demon, sum, uh, Demon Lord Summon or something to that effect. And then once Vengeful mm. Waters went up last turn, it instantly turned, got, like, okay, turn back yeah. on all the blood sacking, just in order to make sure that he doesn't have to deal with those elementals himself. Is a ball that can't blood sack, right? No, I can't, they can't remember. They, they can't, okay. Second, I believe in all three eras. So yeah, they're, they're, this growth here is what I looked at, and I was like, that looks like blood sacrifice. So Thank yeah, you. there's some intense Dominion War going on between... Well, Gath and Zabalba and, you know, everybody. But the other interesting thing looking at the Dominion graph here, so you can see TNG's Dominion sharply drop. And this was almost certainly people were like, stop and preach. <laughs> so, you know, for, for Pan, the only people that can do that are Dryads. Um, well, that they would have recruited. I mean, they, that they would have recruited. They technically yeah. have those Minotaur priest guys as well, but you don't buy them. Right, right, right. Yeah. So, okay. Message from Erythia. I was relying on my Hydra for the last few turns, and I'm fully back now. Obviously, that last battle didn't go exactly as planned. Unfortunately, Pan made an error with his God Drop. I was counting on the dro God Drop destroying most of the mages, or at least the gem reserves. But, well, I still did inflict some casualties to TNG. Don't think he can keep this up much longer. Unfortunately, I'm no longer in a position to exploit this too much. But at least I gave him 
I will have my vengeance. Man, don't don't anger this Arithia player. <laughs> yeah, he's the guy that nap broke oh, over his persona yeah. that Arith that Inchi uh, cheated him out of a province. Yeah, it's it's a pretty small grievance, I think, if for for this kind of escalation. But I hope it was worth it for Tichi TMG just to screw me out of a single province. Oh, the salt. Yeah, and the drop that he was referring to was where Pangea's god got sent back with returning from last turn. Right, right. Oh, oh. my. Oh, my. So there's a Stormstaff Golem. And this is, oh, yeah, Wind of Death. Okay. Two Wind of Death casters. With and 10 the... boosters. Like, this is high yeah. impact. And he's high even impact. screening this with the ghouls. Right. Yeah, which is, by the way, a great way to do it. And then the golem, I wonder if he's doing doom or... What is over here? Oh, <gasps> a lot of mages. Yeah, no, this is Arethia's army. Like, he he's uh, dropping on the exposed army with this. I think oh, he's doing he did Vortex. Vortex of Return. Yeah. So there was nothing better to do, but because by the time, oh my god. <laughs> by the time that they could communion up to even start casting spells, the golem, had, it was a turn one vortex. Was it turn one or turn two? Oh, it, it was, was turn one. Wind of what, one wind of death from each mage. Yeah. Yeah, okay, so he's preparing to cast vortex. You're right, yeah, it's round one. Peace? <laughs> this is one of the things that's really cool that you can do with the spell casting times. In that, like, the spell that takes longer to cast, you can reliably expect it to go off later. Yeah. And something else, Ooh. like, the most common use for that that I've seen is with putting buffs on elementals. In that, like, you time the spell so that the elemental gets cast just before your buff spell goes off. So whether that's, you know, your mass protection or army of X, or even just, like, an iron warrior thing where they cast a spell that offsets their cast time round one. Yeah. Um, and while this looks extremely efficient, and in some ways it is, there's about a 7% chance you get sent to the void and die. So if you want to figure out the real cost of doing this as TNG, you take the cost of all the gear on all these mages and whatever gold cost they have too, and you multiply that by, you know, 0 0.07, and that's going to give you the cost. So, you know, it's probably... I think the golem has a decent chance of making it out of the void. I mean, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. I think everything that goes to the void it is, I consider that because it's got to survive and then it's going to survive when it comes back on land. But like well, here, if we just look at it, this is 20, uh, 45, uh, 55. So if it's 55 gems and then 7%, that's okay. It's pretty cheap. It's only like two or three gems tax, basically. Or expected yeah. value, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Ooh. Did plenty of damage to be worth that cost, though. Yeah. Killed 30 mages. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, Arithia. I don't know. If, I don't think... I mean, Arithia is talking about, like... I hope it was worth it. But, like... This war has been horrible for Arithia. I mean, it's been absolutely horrible. He's yeah, like, basically almost guaranteed he won't win the game. Like, let me go to provinces. So Arithia has gone from here to here, while the people that were in position one and two went from here to here, and from here to here, and from here to here. Like, this is the worst thing that could have happened to Arithia. And he's like, well, at least I showed him. Yeah, I don't think that Arithia... I mean, we've kind of been criticizing Arithia for a little bit now, but, like, these late-game turns are very hard. There are so many things yeah. that you need to protect against uh, that you do need to, like, you know, actually put quite a lot of effort into your turns in order to avoid all these traps that people can throw at you. So it, it is very hard to play these turns, and it does require, like, a pretty significant amount of effort in order to pull it off well. And Arithia just doesn't seem to be prepared to the same degree that the Pangea, Gath, and Chivalva players are. And yeah, even Chivalra yeah. has just been very reticent to make these sorts of heavy commitments of mages that Arithia has. Yeah, I, I do think it's worth... Like, what I'm hitting at, though, is, like, okay, vengeance is also a useful tool, right? Like, you can get your vengeance against somebody to, like, make sure people don't cross you in the future or, like, 
so that you have a reason to do what you're, you know, like it makes you more predictable to other players where like I'm executing this war to get vengeance. Like it gives you a predictable motive so that you're like a reliable actor to other players. They like know what you're going to do because you're upset with this player. You're going to attack. Like there's value in it and being a predictable actor, right? And vengeance is one way to kind of do that. However, <laughs> like it's, there's also pitfalls to it. Like you should be trying to set the game state up so that like your position advances and like to be so hard over on like just vengeance. Like he's missed the point, which is probably most important that we've been talking about, which is like he kind of needed TNG and probably also Zabalba as a hedge to Pan and, and Gath. As a counterweight, yeah. Right, um, and he just kind of got salty over one thing and fucked them over, but fucked himself over honestly more. Like, he honestly fucked himself over. I mean, TNG, sure, they're out of the game, so I guess maybe they got fucked over more, but it wasn't from him. It was from all the other players eating him. I wouldn't, so, first of all, I don't disagree that, like, you know, from a strategy perspective, it would have been better to continue working with TNG. Uh, however, I'll also say that in terms of the like impact of deciding that TNG must die, like I think that from you know that decision, it's still possible to come out ahead by just grabbing a bunch of TNG territory successfully. And really yeah. a lot of the problem came that execution. The Borifia had like actually executed his offensive well such that he didn't have these disastrous mage losses, which we've kind of been seeing literally turn over turn for yeah. I want to say like last three or four turns from Arithia and actually came out ahead on land, then, you know, it would kind of be a different story. Like, yeah, maybe, you know, from a grand strategy perspective, he could have picked a different partner, but at least he's still, like, you know, in the running in the top four. But that's kind of no longer the case, not as a matter of motivation, but really more as a matter of execution. I think that, you know, it, it really just does come down to uh, scripting and gameplay. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. There's just something. I don't know what it is. I can't put my finger on it, but there's something about this message where I'm like, I think you've missed the point. You know, like it's like in some ways gloating over like, I think I've screwed him at least. And it's like, oh, OK, I mean, yeah, it's really more that other players screwed over TNG and Arithia just allowed them to do it by being this distraction. And in so right. doing, he basically kind of took himself out of the game just by throwing away these expensive <laughs> stacks. That's exactly what happened. And that message just doesn't really reflect it. But okay, <laughs> but how you described it is exactly what happened. Okay, let's let's. I guess we just look here at the TNG portion of the map. This is where everything's happening. We already saw that cool magic face attack. Yeah, this is World War T. Yeah. Is Zabalba going? Ooh, Zabalba is going on the throne. Yeah, I think that at this point he must have negotiated it with Arithia, with Arithia kind of realizing that he didn't have the forces in the area to take the throne himself. And so he's kind of like giving Shivalba the go-ahead to grab it. And given Shivalba's immense seed strength, he can instantly pop it. Did this... This is where the army wipe happened. I wonder, did he do turn one anti-magic, and was he just late? No, he didn't cast it. Oh, no, it. he just did straight up communion. So this is... I, we should have mentioned it here. What you almost certainly want to do with every late game stack, especially when you're fighting the people with like air death cross paths on national recruits, is you want to turn one anti magic. It just like do not put it in a communion. Don't do power of the spheres first. Don't do anything to op like over optimize. Like oh, if I did power of the spheres, it will cost less fatigue. No, you just do turn one anti magic. So you need to be astral two. So you just find it anybody who's an astral random like this guy. Put a clam of pearls on him. Turn one anti magic. Yeah, you know that's both very cheap for Arithia to do and very reliable, just because they will naturally have a fair number of astral two mages. Yeah. So, you know, that's another little small mistake there. Um... The other thing, though, is that looking at the army, I I'm not sure it would be with uh, Rain of Stones either. Like he's still not protecting oh, yeah. against battlefield clear stuff in general like this is the right. one that killed him but there are any number of other battlefield clear things which would have been damaging as well including you know bone grinding and whatnot well i think this army was a reinforcement for the throne army right so last turn it was here and there was a big arithia battle on the throne 
Oh, and, yeah. And now you see he moved it over to that farm. Yeah. Right. And the thing is, is in the throne army, there actually were supporting mages that would have put up like mass protection and fog. Like he had a fairy queen. He probably had a couple other summoned mages. So this army, if it made it there, probably would have been resistant to some of these attacks. But, mm -hmm. you know, we see how that happened. Yeah, it was a logistics issue then as much as a scripting error. But if he was just pulling it back and not planning on having a big fight, you know, the sweaty thing to do is you script this army explicitly to deal with magic phase attacks, right? And there's a lot of them. You know, there's Wind of Death. There's Bone Grinding, potentially, from, like, Bettyheim still, I think. There's, you know, teleporting in, doing Rain of Stones. There's a bunch of different things you could potentially have to worry about. But anyway, that's what you would want to do as you pull these guys back. Yeah, protect against the stuff that can actually interrupt their retreat. Right. Okay. Patrolling some scouts out. Since our sage is moving around. Oh, God, that's a lot of TNG Dominion on this fort. Um, yeah, that's a throne TNG has held for a long time, and which also hasn't faced serious Dom push until very recently. Yeah, and it's two times Dominion Shrink plus five, so that's a full 25% chance of getting a Water Elemental attack here. Yeah, and we we do see that Pangea has been putting up temples in, I, honestly, most of their provinces, but we still need to see them put up a temple in that lake to help push against the fort. Yeah. So, yeah, let's check out these TNG mages. This is one of those, like, mini thug squads that I actually value very heavily where they're actually functioning as casters with defense buffs rather than as, like, thugs oh. in terms of guys that hit people in melee. Did he get... He didn't get region on these guys, which I think might be an issue. Yeah, but... This yeah. guy should have cast region. I wonder if he... Oh, he fatigued out. I think it's probably worth doing region first and then hell, but there's a chance you get, like, soul slater stuff. Because yeah. now they're in melee, it's not really going to happen. Yeah, I, I see what you mean, just because regen is very important when you have Soul Vortex up, just in order to recoup the damage that you're doing to yourself, basically. Yeah. They ate a Lance Charge here, and that was kind of not great. Did they get... They did get Body Ethereal, though, but they didn't get Luck. Yeah. Yeah, they not really... sure this was perfectly done, but... The, yeah, generally when you do these stack thugs, you want at least some cheap armor item on everyone. And it looks like he could only afford a couple of them to actually be fully geared. Are they doing healing light here to keep these guys... The Comslaves alive, yeah. When you have yeah. small communions, the AI will cast that off script, which is really nice. Oh, but they went under four slaves. I think they started with more. And the effect of that is that they're only boosted by, by one. So they're only Astral 2, which is enough to do Paralyze, but not enough to do Soul Slay or anything like that. Mind burn is good enough against humans, though. Well, not this guy. Yeah. Well, that guy's got their uh, soul vortex temp HP. But yeah. You're right. And, well, and he got paralyzed. So, you know, he couldn't run because I think he should have maybe routed. No, I think but... he they never hit went below the route HP threshold. So it kills seven cataphracts, gets these guys to run. I don't know if that's really worth it, but I think you'd have to make plays like this. I think. When you look at who actually died, it was everybody but the Soul Vortex guy. So, you know, he lost 15 gems here. He can then... pick up some of those items, actually. Yeah, he could. He could. And he has the slots for it. Yeah, if you pick up the items, that would have been pretty good. Yeah, still not great in terms of, you know, even just gold loss, just because Pangea lost only PD and 7 Cataphracts. But on the other hand, like he pointed out, PG has to kind of make those plays. Yeah, you have to. I think it could have been done maybe a tiny bit better, but it was... Pretty budget, you know. I mean, it wasn't a ton of gems invested. And what we've seen before is these small squads of, like, six centaur sages uh, have been really hard to deal with. Yeah, he... Like, they're, they're really hard to come up with economical answers to. So his communion was set up three and three. So I actually think that was kind of the problem there, is uh... if he was just four and four, it would have won. Is that what happened? Yeah, he didn't lose any. So it was always three and three, I think. Oh, but they could have run. Yeah, okay. That's kind of weird. 
Yeah, undeterred, Pangea rides into vengeful waters here. He's like, okay, we're going to keep raiding. I think that at this point, he perceives these little parties where, you know, it's, you know, between five and ten ages as being worthwhile. Like that, like, yeah, I can just lose these guys yeah. and still be fine. Particularly given that he's probably pretty close to his upkeep to income and he has enough forts to instantly re-up as long as he's not losing, like, you know, stacks of 80 per turn. Yeah. So he's not going all out, right? Like, he's not driving forward with two stacks of 200 sages at every available opportunity to try to kill TNG as quickly as possible, right? Like, he is being actually a fair bit more controlled just in terms of, like, where and how hard he's pushing out. So these little raiding parties are, I guess, what Pangea would consider totally acceptable losses where, you right. know, I lose these, I re-up them, no problem. Whereas the big stacks, you know, what we've been seeing before where he's just slamming 120 sages at any given problem, those are going to wait until he can actually push the dom forward. Right. So like this sport is in five, I've turned the candles on here, five TNG Dominion, but these are Pangean Dominion. So he's just kind of waiting for this to kind of percolate over this way. One problem for TNG is they're actually getting down. They don't have many temples left. So they've got, you know, this throne over here and then a couple. Why well, do they still have a fair number, actually? Yeah, they've yeah. got like seven or eight temples. So, yeah. And since they're in their heartlands, they have high enough of a base dom that's going to be hard to preach down. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. But yeah. So, and on top of like for five candles, that's basically a 15% chance of getting a water elemental. So. That's kind of another problem with these Centaur Sage armies is they're not really great at sieging. A lot of times when we've seen Pan sieging these forts, they're sieging for like two or three turns. And that is, in my opinion, a complete no-go for fighting into vengeful waters. So we're probably going to see them recruit some siege chaff here. Yeah, I don't tend to consider lack of siege chaff to be a crippling factor for a strategy because siege chaff is easy to come by in many different ways, right? Like right. just buy seven gold units. Just... You know, <laughs> when you're in the late game, you can just summon giant eagles and stuff. But there, there isn't really any stage of the game, I think, where siege chaff is particularly, like, hard to come by. Like, you can always... Right, and it, we see, finally, this is probably the first siege, like, proper siege chaff army that we've seen from Pangeo here, so... Yeah, but, like, um... even before, Pangeo was just running around with those satyr raiding parties, which incidentally yeah. just become siege chaff. The harpies right. out there are a little different in that they're actually, like, dedicated to the, to the role because they're just cheap flyers with extremely high map move. So they siege right. one fort, and then they go and siege the next fort. And you don't, you know, love having them in your armies during a fight, but they're not necessarily actively detrimental either, because they're still scriptable. Yeah. Okay, well, I think that's that. On Vettiheim, well, I, well, let's make sure we finish TNG here. I don't think there's much else. We've looked at all this theater, patrolled out some guys. Sebalba's on this throne. TNG, did the army escape in some way? No. So there's a that's that force that was in here from TNG the previous turn, I think, is still in there unless That's some mages that were in that stack. He might have been trying to evacuate. I don't know if he could have two map moved through here. Oh, but this was a magic phase attack too. Yeah, so I think it's possible that the magic phase attack interrupted the movement. Yeah. And if that was what happened, then those that would have been really interesting if TNG was trying to get these guys out, but then he couldn't because of this magic phase attack. Because that would block a two-province move, and then they're probably going to die to the murder kitties. I just don't think there's any way with a small handful of mages and 40 troops that you can kill 200 Aussies. Yeah, he lost too many cubes in that battle against Erythia in order to beat that Aussie stack with cube yeah. power. So my expectation is it's going to be either Vortex of Returning from inside the throne or yes. Gateway one way or another. Like you either Gateway out or you Gateway in. Probably out. I think that makes sense. Okay, so that's this battle. Tienchi and Agartha. Oh, Tienchi using a Vampire Lord here. I mean, he has them, so may as well. Not moving on to the throne yet. Yeah, the throne's 10 Tienchi or 9 Tienchi Dominion. In the land of Vettiheim... Oh, so this is a Shivalba poking with one of those, like, you know, when we talk about like storming forts, how you want to bring a serious enough army that it can win if there isn't a proper defense. I think that's kind yeah. of what Shivalba is bringing here. We're like, this isn't all in, not by any stretch, but it's serious enough that if Eddieheim isn't serious about his commitment, that it will actually at least siege the capital. Right. 
this is like, hey, this is just a check, basically. How how much are you putting on your, your defense here, your cap? Yeah, and... just being a scouting attempt. It is bringing enough sacreds and maid support that it can be like a, a minimal defense or a trap. Like, oh, I'm doing a Wailing Winds trap or a, a Wind of Death trap type thing. Then it's like, oh, well, actually, I can kill that. Right, and I think if you gave Zabalba the option, hey, you can't change what you send, but you could take this back, would you do it? I think they would probably say, yeah, I, you know, this is not a great trade for them. But we're seeing the outcome where it got killed. There was a decent chance that there were only a few guys patrolling and this killed that, so it's just how the dice go. Yeah, But we, we do right see a... Before. Yeah. Yeah, we do see a, a goblin ending army right here. And presumably, I think what he was thinking was let's send this small army on, see if we can get on top of his capital, and then like come through with this proper army in the next turn and uh, kill him. <clears throat> so we'll see. Yeah, we might get a big fight next turn with the Himes last stand mark three. Yeah, that would be pretty cool. Oh. Vettiheim attacking here with some Nephil Jarls. I'm no, trying to get them out. Treat, yeah. Oh no. Oh god. Got caught, got buffed. <laughs> oh god. Rest in peace, Nephil Jarl. Dear God. Okay. But yeah, so Vettiheim had been trying to retreat out the previous turn. So those are guys that had basically retreated back into the fort, is my suspicion. Yeah. Okay. So I think that's that. Let's go through here and make sure we didn't miss anything. This might be kind of cool to watch. I don't think we watched this. The TNG thug? Yeah, no, we haven't. Yeah. Oh, it's not a thug. It's a skeleton spammer. With a shade mail oh, on him, too. It is a thug. <laughs> oh, yeah, it is a thug. How does he read? Oh, it's oh, he's diseased though, huh? Did he get that at the start? No, I think he was already diseased. You're right. <clears throat> that's probably why he was set to attack so he can recoup some of that health. Mm, that's a good point. Okay, I think we've seen pretty much all of this so far. Yeah, I'd say so. I think that's turn seventy three. All right. Well, with that, we will leave you, and uh, we'll see you next time on Turn 74. Cheers.